Good morning. Let me get situated here. My name is Frank. I'm the Mayfair Robe Campus Pastor. For those who know, haven't shaved my head yet. It's a whole thing. We'll talk about it later. Um, as, as you know, we're taking a quick break in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John because we're going to enter into Holy Week. We're going to talk about the triumphal entry today. We're going to talk about uh, his trial and his sacrifice on Friday and then on Easter Sunday. We're going to talk about his resurrection. I want to invite you, as you already heard, please join us. Good Friday, Easter Sunday. Invite someone. We'd love to see you there. If you have your Bible... Open up to Matthew chapter 21, Matthew 21. If uh, you want to use the Bibles in the chairs, it's on page 826, 826. While you're turning there, let me tell you, I used to sleep in church a lot, all right. Um, it was incredibly boring, all right. Uh, like, like when I was a teenager, it just felt so boring to me. Now, the music was my favorite part, and I have to stress this. Late 90s, early 2000s worship, another level. All right? Like, have you heard Trading My Sorrows? Like, after today, Google or go on Spotify and look up Trading My Sorrows by Israel and the New Breed. That song goes so hard. Like, when it gets to the bridge, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. Like, that song, like, it's a thing, bro. Like, it's so good. But the sermons were so boring in my church. Like, I, I, I don't know if the pastor that I grew up in is watching this. But your sermons were boring. Like, it, it put me to sleep, and my mom would, like, pinch me to wake me up all the time because it was just so boring. But I like Palm Sunday, all right. Christmas was great because it's Christmas. And, like, the music you sang in church was also the music that, like, you would be singing, that you would hear on the radio. Um, it was also, after the, church, after the service, there was, like, really good food. At least in my family, after Christmas, the service, we would have good food. And Easter was also fun because we would wear, like, purple and like pastel colors to church, and then afterwards we'd also eat good food. Technically, I guess I only like church services that end with really good food after, but that's not the point. Uh, I also really like Palm Sunday. I love Palm Sunday because it was the only Sunday after, after church where we go home with a plant, all right? Um, I lived in Florida, so there's palm trees everywhere when I grew up. Um, but Palm Sunday, everyone got a palm frond. Well, a leaf of a palm tree, of a palm branch. And, uh, and I was like that guy at Costco who, like, changes his disguise to see how many free samples they could get. You know what I'm saying? Like, my goal was to see how many palm fronds I could get on a Sunday, on Palm Sunday. And one Sunday, this is impressive, I had eight palm fronds. All right? And so though I don't remember a single, me like, word from the message of that Sunday, I braided the dopest palm bracelet that, like, made all my, like, middle school friends jealous. You know, I, it, was, it was so fun. Today is Palm Sunday, and perhaps Palm Sunday is odd for you, right? Like, it's supposed to be more significant than, like, normal Sundays. There aren't holidays, but it's not as big as Christmas and Easter. And, and you might have memories, like I do, of, like, being handed a palm frond in church, um, not knowing really, like, what the whole thing is about and, and why you're getting a leaf on Sunday morning. Or... Uh, like we just sang the song a few minutes ago, like you said the word Hosanna, but when I was in middle school, I thought they were saying Rosanna, like Roseanne, the TV show. And I don't know, I was like, what does Hosanna mean? Like that's like, I'm, it's, it's those type of words, if you didn't grow up in church, you don't know what it means. At Epicos, we've done many different things. On some, uh, in the past, on Palm Sunday, we've handed out the palm fronds, kids have come in, we're waving, singing Hosanna. And then some Sundays, we've like skipped Palm Sunday altogether and just focused on Easter. Um, though, we, though we're not handing out palm branches today, what I want to do for us is recontextualize Palm Sunday for us. Like, because cause you may know the passages in the Bible where Palm Sunday comes from. And, and you may even, like, know a couple of the things of what, palm, what happened on Palm Sunday. But for some of us, Palm Sunday is just tradition. It's, the, it's like the pregame to Easter. Like, you really, really don't know what's happening on this day. And I think it's important for us to, like, take a second to read the text that we get Palm Sunday from. And I, I want to hopefully show to you two significant things. One thing that's significant about Jesus on Palm Sunday, and one significant thing about us that happens in Palm Sunday. So let's start Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. 
This took place to fulfill what has been spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them the, their cloaks, and he sat on them. So as Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, he told the disciples to go into the village and get a donkey that was tied up there and bring it to him. And, like, I love that. I love that it says, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Don't you wish you had that kind of power? Like, go to Chick-fil-A, get me a spicy sandwich with cheese, and if anyone asks why you're asking, God needs them, right? Like, don't you wish you had that kind of authority? Because you would get so much stuff for free. Okay, uh, but... What is really going on here? Like, what's happening? Did Jesus prearrange this? Did the, the owner of the animals have an angelic vision that this would happen? Was there, like, a secret code word that if you say the word Lord, you just get stuff? Like, what is going on here that this is happening? Uh, we don't know. What we are told is in verse 6 and 7 that Jesus told his disciples what to expect and what to do. And it happened exactly how Jesus said it would. Whether the interaction was natural or supernatural is not the point. But there is a statement here that should cause us to pause for a second. Verse 3, it says, the Lord needs them. He needs these animals. That's unusual. Because it should be our understanding that God doesn't need anything. Like if, if God has created everything and everything belongs to him and, and he owns everything, why does he need something? Is it that Jesus, who's walked his entire ministry, is all of a sudden really tired? And wants to ride on a donkey for a little bit? Like, one characteristic of God that separates him from all of us is that he is fully and completely self-sufficient. He is never in need. So why does he say he needs this? Well, I can tell you, he doesn't need it because he is tired and doesn't want to walk anymore. The reason he needs these animals is because he's trying to reveal to Israel who he is. He needs them to fulfill a prophecy so that they can fully understand what he is there to do. Matthew quotes Zechariah 9.9, a, a prophecy that happened 500 years earlier. And the prophecy was this. We just read it. Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus needs these animals because he's fulfilling a biblical prophecy that said there will be a person walking, riding on a donkey and they are the king. They're the true king. But this king, Jesus, is riding on a donkey for another reason as well. He is riding on a donkey to reframe what true power is. He's trying to reframe our understanding of what real power is. At this very time, at this exact moment, Pontius Pilate, the governor at the time, is on the other side of town. And as the governor, as he is coming into town, but because of the size of the crowd that's in Jerusalem and because of the festivities, he is entering um, on a giant war horse. He knows there's a risk of an insurrection. He knows there's a risk of a rebellion. So to make sure they know not to do anything as they're all in Jerusalem, he enters into a town on a big white horse with, with a bunch of soldiers with swords and spears and muscles. And, and he wants to, he, they're there because like to protect them. But he's also doing this because it's a parade of power. He wants all of Israel to know that the government is too big, too powerful, too mighty, and there's nothing you can do about it. For this governor, he wants to know that he will use, he wants everyone to know he will use force if he has to, and you have nothing to respond to it. That's why he's coming on a big horse with all these soldiers. And so if Jesus is trying to show that he is this promised king, where's his war horse? Where is the muscle? Where are the soldiers? Jesus could summon all the angels to, to parade with him. Where is that? Where is his show of power? Jesus riding a donkey is like the president going down I-94 on a tricycle. It doesn't show power. In fact, it shows the opposite. And that's the point. It doesn't show worldly power because he's trying to reframe how we understand what true power is. By riding a donkey, he's showing that his kingdom is not like anything in this world. That true power in his kingdom is humility and love. For Jesus... Royal power is not showing off your opulence and your wealth. It's showing his humility. For Jesus, true power is not in his ability to defeat his enemies. It is in his ability to die for his enemies. 
So riding the donkey fulfills prophecy, but it also shows that his rule and reign is unlike the kings that anybody in Israel is familiar with. 1 Corinthians says that the, the things of the Lord is foolishness to the world. And so much of Jesus' teachings is reframing how we understand how to live. And if you're honest, when you hear Jesus' teachings, we can appreciate his love. We can appreciate his compassion. But when he tells us how to live, sometimes it feels like the way he's describing for us to live is a little counterintuitive in how the world really functions, right? But that's the point. That's what Jesus is saying here. I I Ephesians tells us that Satan governs this world. Mark did a really good job last week distinguishing between the earth, the creation, the world that God made versus the world that's governed by the enemy. And he reminds us that we are not to love this world or the things of this world because it is dying away and it is antithetical to the kingdom of God. So a fair question that all of us should be asking here is, how do we see power? How do we understand true power in our life? Uh, Jesus shows us that true power is not making sure everyone knows that you have more influence and power over other people. Jesus shows us that true power is not having more wealth than others so you can buy what you want or create any security that you need. Jesus shows us that true power is not your ability to control uh, what makes you anxious or sad or worried. Again, he shows us that true power is not even your ability to prevent suffering or to prevent difficult circumstances from having in your life. Jesus is showing us that what actually is true, meaningful kingdom change in this world, what is actually true power is sacrifice, humility, compassion, mercy, and love. True power in the eyes of Jesus and in his kingdom is sacrifice, humility, compassion, mercy, and love. True power came from the Christians in the early church. While being persecuted would bring medical care to the poor and to the immigrants when the rest of the culture rejected and pushed them away. True power came from the Christians around that same time who would rescue babies literally on their deathbed because the culture would say if they didn't want a child, they would just cast them away to die. True power came from Christian abolitionists who said that all people are created in the image of God and are worthy of living life, not as property or in subjugation, but as free people. Christians are the ones who have pioneered our understanding of modern health care, orphanages, and the abolitionist movement. And the heart behind all three of those is a very Christian one because it comes from a place that says every person is worthy of value and dignity because all people are created in the image of God. So the story of Palm Sunday demonstrates that Jesus is king, but he's not like a king that we expect. He's not a king that they expected. In fact, him riding on a donkey is a demonstration of protest against what the world sees as power. Jesus is rejecting earthly systems of power. Jesus rejects the need for recognition, admiration, and wealth, and all the things that we put under the umbrella of power that we understand it. Palm Sunday reminds us that Jesus is the humble king, ushering in a kingdom unlike anything we understand or know. So that's what we see in Palm Sunday about Jesus. But what does it say about us? Let's keep going. Verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus the Na from Nazareth of Galilee. There's a couple historical things I have to share with you. So, so hang in there with me. For us to fully understand what's going on, we have to talk about a little bit of history. First, the reason why there's crowds in Jerusalem is because people from all over are coming there to celebrate Passover. Passover is a celebration where God's people were being were set free from slavery in Egypt. And so they would celebrate Passover every single year in Jerusalem. And people were hyped. I mean, think about the Deer District during a playoff game. Like, there's just thousands of people out in the Deer District, like, 
not during a playoff game, like during the regular season because it's just they're going to see the game. But during a playoff game, there's people in the streets, in the Deer District, just without tickets, just hype because the potential of the Bucks going to the finals, right? This is kind of the energy and the crowd that's in Jerusalem. There was a, a historian from this time who estimated that one year during Passover, there was 250,000 lambs that were sacrificed in the temple. And in and, and, and Jewish tradition, one lamb could cover 10 people. So there was an estimated 2.5 million people in Jerusalem one year during Passover. So around the time Jesus is entering there, there could be millions of people in Jerusalem. It's crowded. Add another layer to this in terms of the energy that was there. There was, uh, Israel was under Roman occupation. So imagine one day your government has been overthrown and everything that you own has been taken from you and it becomes incredibly difficult to live. And the people who are natural citizens of this new government um, get privileges above you and your peers, uh, whoever bows the knee to this new government gets favor above you as well. Uh, what was once rightfully your country is not yours anymore, and there isn't anything you can do about it. You don't have the military might. You don't have the manpower. You don't have anything remotely close to fighting this government. And this is where Israel finds themselves at this time. They're struggling to live. They're powerless, and they have no realistic possibility for a future. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like Israel is back in Egypt, and they have a new pharaoh in Caesar who heads up Rome. And so every year as the Jews gathered for Passover and they're remembering being set free from Egypt, they're thinking, can we do this again? Can God rescue us again? Can God send a new liberator, a strong man who is going to rescue us out of the grips of Rome, who can overthrow this Pharaoh so that we can be set free? And so when people saw Jesus enter into Jerusalem on a donkey and they're remembering the passage from Zechariah and they're seeing and they're hearing people shout Hosanna, they're like, maybe he's the new Moses. Maybe he's the guy. And so Passover explains why there's so many people in Jerusalem and why there's so much energy in the space and why Pilate has to come on a war horse to make sure everyone calms down because he has a full military behind him. Some people knew who Jesus was and they saw his miracles. They knew about Lazarus rising from the dead. And so they're saying that this guy could really be the guy. But there were also, I would imagine, some bandwagon fans who, who, are, who are just there to be hyped. They're like, I just want things to change, and everyone's shouting for this guy, so I'm going to shout with them, right? That's kind of the energy in the space of what's happening at that moment. But the other thing you should know is this. About 150 years before this moment, there was an event called the Maccabean Revolt. And in the Maccabean Revolt, there was these two brothers, Judas and Simon, who led Israel into a victory over another country's occupation at that time. The, Syrian, the Syrians occupied Israel. And so there was this ruler named Antichrist IV who was the Syrian ruler at the time. And he did evil, wicked things in Israel at that time. He slaughtered thousands of Jews. He uh, desecrated the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. And he banned the Torah in Israel. He burned the first five books of the Old Testament. People hated this guy. And so when the Maccabean brothers came in and overthrew and took out Syria from the occupation, they not only got their land back, but they got their temple back. And this event in Israel's history is celebrated to this day in the celebration that we know as Hanukkah. And so when the brothers came back from regaining the land and regaining the temple and kicking out Syria, the crowd was so excited for that victory that they waved palm branches. Now, the thing you have to know about palm branches from that time is every nation in that area used palm branches as a symbol of military victory. If there was a war and the, and the, and the general came back, Everyone's waving palm branches. And so in every culture, this was a celebration of military victory. And so when the Maccabean brothers came in, they're waving their palm branches. This is our victory. They stamped uh, the palm leaves on under coins. So every time they exchanged money, they're reminding themselves, hey, we won. Right? They're, they're, they're reminding themselves of this military victory. So when Jesus enters Jerusalem, in many ways, this is parodying the Maccabean revolt. The people want to be set free from Roman occupation. And Jesus is entering like a king. And so what do the people do? They lay out palm branches. They are projecting on him the victory that they want. They are preemptively claiming that this man is going to bring victory to Israel in the same way as those brothers did 150 years ago. 
in Matthew, it doesn't say palm branches. It just says branches, but in the Gospel of John, it says specifically they laid out palm branches. And so, so what I want to do is recontextualize this concept of palm branches. Because though it's a symbol of victory, I think it actually says something deeper about these people who are laying down these palm branches. The people need help. They're literally shouting Hosanna, which means help us now, save us now. It means save us. Like, like they're shouting out for salvation. They're shouting out for help. And they feel hopeless. They want freedom. And they will attach it to anyone or anything that gives them a resemblance of hope. And so they see Jesus on this symbol Riding a donkey as a king. It's Passover. They want freedom. Their hearts are stirred for it. They're crying out for it. And so they're so hyped that they're laying down palm branches because they believe that maybe this guy can overthrow Rome. They're laying palm branches before Jesus because they're acknowledging Rome is too great. Israel's too weak and small. The world's power is too much. And they need help from outside of themselves if they want to be set free. So these palm branches are a signal that they're weak and they need help. These folks are demonstrating something that sometimes we struggle with. Like, I don't know if it's because of maybe the family you grew up in or maybe you went to a church that says, hey, you should conceal your weaknesses. But we believe that we have to present ourselves as perfect and put together. When we arrive to church when someone asks how you're doing, oh, we're great. And that's sometimes not really true because behind the scenes, Your life is falling apart. You're struggling with anxiety or depression or betrayal or work issues or health issues. There's a number of different things. But you don't show your weaknesses and you don't ask for help. And it could be because you don't want to bother anyone or be seen as a nuisance. You want to prove that you can do it yourself. You don't want to be rejected when someone doesn't help you. Or you don't want to be seen as weak or less than. When we refuse to show our weaknesses... What we're doing is we're pretending to be self-sufficient. To be human is to be limited. It's to be in need. You were created by God to be dependent on him, to be in need. When we admit we are weak, when we admit that we need help, when we pull out our palm branches showing our need for salvation, that is when God can actually do something about your situation. But be careful. Because as we are reading this, the palm branches do demonstrate their need for salvation, but they also are showing how they want to control how God saves them, right? The crowd sees Jesus as king, and when they re- what they really want is they want a better pilot. They want what Pilate is doing just in favor of them. They want Jesus to be on the big horse with the muscles and, and, and the firepower. Like, they want the same oppressive government— But they want it on their side. They just want them to be able to kick out Rome and to kick out the Roman Empire. They want Jesus to defeat their enemies. They lay palm branches because they want the same military victory that happened 150 years earlier. They want Jesus to be a conquering king. And aren't we like them as well, right? Like we want Jesus to save us, but we want him to save us how we want to be saved. When we say we want our marriages to be fixed... What we're actually saying is we want our spouses to change. When we say we want our kids to be saved, what we're saying is we want our kids to stop embarrassing us and to stop challenging us. When we say we want prayers for our job, what we say, what we mean is we want to be promoted, acknowledged, and well compensated, even if it's at the expense of other people around us. We say we want to be saved, but we want to control how God does the saving. We want his salvation, but we don't want our lives to change. We want acceptance but without the accountability. We want his love without righteous living. We want his grace but without the transformation. We want his power not used towards us but for us against others. The book of Revelation tells us that Jesus will come down on a white horse. The conquering king that they desired will come but it's not going to be in this moment. The king is trying to conquer an enemy that's greater than Pilate and greater than Caesar and greater than Rome. And and to defeat this enemy will not be by their death, but it will be by his death. They're They're saying, says free from the Romans, and Jesus is saying, I'm saying you free from sin and death. 
The, the Israel is saying, uh, free us from Rome the same way God freed us from Egypt. And, and Jesus is saying, I'm trying to set you free from the systems that created Egypt and Rome in the first place. For Jesus to truly be king, we have to accept that he has come to save us the way he has chosen to save us. In his wisdom, with the kind of power that makes no sense in this world, but it's the only true power that can save. The text ends with people asking, who is this? And I think it's funny because I imagine that the same people who are saying Hosanna are, are, are also saying, who are we saying Hosanna to? Like, have you ever been there? Like, I, uh, I, I, I talked about this before. My friend James lives in West Virginia, and, and he took me to a West Virginia football game. And I was so distracted by the bag of peanuts that I had. Like, I missed half the game. Like, there's something about sitting in a live sporting game, like, eating peanuts and shucking shells on the floor that, like, I just was zoning out for, like, a whole quarter. And I remember I had a handful of peanuts, and everyone got up and started booing the ref. And I was like, oh, I got to get up to boo! And I started booing the ref, too. And then I looked over, like, why are we booing? Like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just participating in this activity. Like, I don't know what's going on. The crowd seeing Jesus is so caught up with their frustration in Rome and their desire for a new Passover, that they don't even know why they're cheering Jesus in the first place. These people want a political figure. They want a military general. And sadly, those same people, when they see Jesus on trial and they see Jesus not doing what they wanted him to do, the same people who shouted Hosanna are going to be in the crowd shouting crucify him. So some of you began going to church because you knew something wasn't right in this world. Or you knew something wasn't right in you. And, and you knew you needed something outside of you to save you. But you had a specific vision of what that salvation should look like. So when you came to Jesus, you tried to stuff Jesus in your vision of how you think your life should be and how you should be saved. And so even today, you might be getting frustrated with our sermons here at Epicos or your time in God's word. Or you may actually be upset at God himself because you feel like he has not kept his end of the promise. But in reality, you're upset at him for not keeping promises that he has never really promised you. To be fair, this isn't your fault sometimes. Like sometimes the church has told you, made huge promises, said that if you behave a certain way, if you do certain things, God will owe you. God has to do something for you if you do something. And if you've heard that before, let me be the first one to say, I'm sorry. Because I'll be clear, Jesus never said, if you put your trust in him, your life will be easy. Jesus never said, if you get your kids to church, they'll be perfect, obedient angels for the rest of their lives. Jesus never said that if you wait to have sex till marriage, your marriage will be perfect and you'll have the best sex life forever. Jesus never said that if you give your money to the church, that you'll be rich and you'll never be in debt or you'll never be in need. Jesus never said that if you stay consistent with your church attendance, you're faithful to your Bible study, that you will find a spouse and you'll have your happily ever after. Jesus never promised any of that. Should we be doing all those things? Yes, because it honors and glorifies God. But if we're doing those things because we're trying to put God in our debt, we've been lied to. Or you've been believing a lie. He never promised those things. But we have created these contracts in our mind and demand Jesus to save us how we want to be saved. But God is not a God who will be constrained to our demands. But if you're willing to take your palm branches as a symbol of your frailty as a symbol of you acknowledging that you are weak and you need help, the, Jesus does make a bunch of promises to you. He says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is not going to conform to our version of salvation that we want. But when you conform to his salvation, he promises you rest. Paul says that Jesus offers you 
a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that makes no sense in this world of conflict and turmoil. The Lord promises to be with us in the hard times, in the difficult circumstances. He promises to never leave you or, 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 or turn his back on you. But he also promises to take every single bit of suffering and hardship and difficult thing and to mold them for your good to turn you more into the image of Jesus. Listen, God can fix your marriage, he can save your kids, and he can heal your body. But God does what he does on his time, in his way, and in his wisdom. In God's kingdom, when we accept our weaknesses, when we accept our frailty, when we accept our inability to save ourselves, God's power shows up. 2 Corinthians verse 12, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we come to the end of ourselves with no pretense... No secret desire to control our circumstances or bend God's will to try to do what we want. It is then that God's power is most seen in our lives. So, if you're a skeptic or you're here trying to see if Jesus is really worth following, one aspect of Christianity that's really compelling to me is the honesty that we have to come to ourselves. Right? Pain and suffering are real. We are not supposed to Photoshop it or pretend it doesn't exist. But when we confess it, when we're honest about our weaknesses, Jesus can do something about it. Remember, Jesus died for the current real version of you so he can transform you into the version that you were created to be. And so if that kind of Christianity sounds interesting to you and you want to learn more about how this king how this Jesus becomes king and how he rescues everybody. I want to encourage you and invite you to this Friday and this Sunday because it's all going to be explained there, how this Jesus truly becomes the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he saves us by his grace. If you're a Christian, I'm asking you, where are your palm branches? We didn't pass any palm branches out, so, like, don't think you missed something, but... Where are your symbols of humility and your need for a savior? Have you tried hiding them because you don't want to be seen as a burden? You don't want to be seen as weak? Jesus knows you don't have it all together. And he knows that because that's why he died for you. That's why he came. Because we are weak. And we need salvation. We need to be saved. And as you wave your palm branches as a signal of your need for help... Are you accepting how Jesus has chosen to help you? Are you getting upset or frustrated that he isn't saving you the way you want to be saved? Are you getting embittered because he's not answering promises that you convinced yourself that he promised you that he never promised you? For Jesus to truly be king, we must let him have free reign and rule according to his desires. And trust that though his ways are not our ways, his ways are the best ways. So, I don't have to remind you about this. Like, I have deleted the news app on my phone. I try to avoid it. It still shows up. I have one podcast I listen to every year for 15 minutes to catch me up on all the world's news. And there's enough in that 15 minutes to give me all the depression I need for a week. It's a pretty miserable world we're living in right now. Wars, conflict, political divide. Racism, sexism, bigotry. There's so many bad things that are happening in this world that it's really easy to feel hopeless and have despair. But in the midst of the noise, in the midst of the, of the, of the anxiety-induced news in this world, Jesus is still seated on the throne. He is still king. And he is still ruling and reigning over everything. And when I start finding myself drifting into anxiety, drifting into fear, because things are not going the way I want them to go, the life is not happening the way I want it to happen, I have to rest because he offers us rest. And I rest in the fact that Jesus is king. He has authority and rule in this world. And there's nothing that's happening that surprised him. There's nothing that's happening that's shocking him. And if Jesus 
if we can trust that he has, that we have confidence in him controlling everything and ruling everything, then we who are the children of God, who are co-heirs with Jesus, we're going to be okay. Jesus is king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, because you have not forgotten us here. Though we forget and we ignore the way you have shown yourself in creation, though we try to conform our desires of who we want you to be in this world, Lord, forgive us for those times that our pride, our arrogance, our selfishness has prevented us from seeing the way you truly want to work in our world. But Lord, we trust and we believe that as we wave our palm branches, not out of a victory we want to see happen, but out of a, a, a humility and, and need for help from you, Lord, we trust that you will show up in our time of need. And Lord, as we are, are open to how you want to save us, how you want to rescue us, how you want to shape our lives, help us to conform to your wisdom, to your desire, to your vision of how our lives should be. Lord, be with us, forgive us, give us grace and mercy to live this life in a way that honors you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Your son is king. Save us now. In your son's name I pray. Amen.